All right, Matchroom Radio with David Diamante. We are back, and this week we are in Nottingham, England, and um, we have a great guest. We have a great show this weekend here in Nottingham. Um, before well, we start real quick, I just want to say thank you for all the love and support. I've, I've been out for a couple of months, um, had a, a tough accident, um, got through it, getting through it, and um, happy to be back. So it's wonderful to be here, and like I said, we have a big show, the WBA Featherweight Championship of the World. We've got Lethal Lee Wood against Irish Michael Conlon. And the gentleman today that we have as our guest, um, Mr. Russ Anbar. First of all, hi, Russ. Nice to see you. Listen, it's, it's great to have you back, Dave, and I, I wish that the people would have had a chance to see the pictures that you were showing us in the elevator because that really puts into perspective your comeback and uh, that you're here today doing this, you know, because that was, uh, I mean, some of the pictures you showed, uh, Conlon went, he uh, turned his head, you know, it was uh, was quite scary what you were through. So it's good to have you back, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And uh, I just want people to know that I have not posted those pictures online because I just thought it's, I wanted to stay positive. No, that's I, fine. I, I didn't sure. want to be gruesome, but... Um, the accident happened, and I am back quickly. I am a resilient guy. I believe in the power of, uh, of the mind. I really do. And um, I talked to the BBC earlier today, and I was telling them some stories about as a kid, um, I shattered my kneecap in eight pieces, and my mom wouldn't take me to the hospital. <laughs> Three days later, it's not broken. I said, Mom, it's broken. I mean, it looked, it looked like a melon. It was disgusting. The moment we go to the doctor... He's like, let me see the leg. He goes, oh, that's broken. My mom goes, I knew it. <laughs> but I, I came up with this mentality, you know. And, um, you know, my dad, we'd be on a hot day in a car with my brother and my sister. And, it's, you know, the summers in New York are brutal. So we'd be back there. And, we're like, Dad, we're thirsty. Be, Drink your spit. You know, that's what my dad would say. So this was kind of the upbringing I had. And this is, this wow. is the mentality I have to get back. I can't stay hurt. There's no feeling sorry for yourself. And, uh, you know, you mess with the bull, you get the horns. I was on a motorcycle. I've ridden them around the world. Um, I've had accidents before. I've broken a lot of bones before. So I knew what it was. Um, and uh, it, uh, this, one was, this one was terrible. You know, four yeah. breaks to the spine, uh, multiple broken ribs. And uh, my knee was, was really, really in bad shape. Yeah, I saw that too. That was, uh, that it, was graphic. Yeah, so it was, it was tough. But, um, and, and I'm still in pain, but I'm getting through it. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to see you. For the fans out there today that don't know you, Russ, you wear a lot of hats in this business. And you've been in this business for a lot of years. Um, yeah. <laughs> you were a, first of all, you were an amateur boxer. Yeah. Short, very short career. Short, yeah. You were a trainer. You owned a boxing gym, which you since gotten rid of. But you owned well, a boxing gym. Well, we still gym. have the, the gym. Still exists. It's my one of my former fighters who's running it now. Yeah, right. that still exists. You are one known as one of the top hand wrap specialists in the world. Thank you. You are an ace cut man. Thank you. You are also, am I right, the founder of Rival Boxing Gear? That is correct. The that's founder of Rival. Well, we summed it all up. Thank you for joining us, folks. Right. That was, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Astronaut. Uh, no, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so you, you wear a lot of hats in the boxing world. And let's go back just a little bit. So you're Canadian. Correct. We're not going to hold that against you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Um, Montreal, yeah? Yeah. Born and bred. The 76 Olympics. Can you take me back to that? Is this yeah. where it really all began for you? You got bit by the bug? Yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, you know, we, it, it was at a time, you know, the Olympics were coming to Montreal, and ABC covered the Olympics in a fashion that I don't think we see today. Um, and, you know, we're able to watch all the fights on TV and watch that evolution of that. To me, still the greatest... Uh, U.S. Olympic team ever. Well, well, hold. On. Okay, so wait. Let's just pause right there, just okay. for a second. So, seventy six, eighty four, or eighty four. Yeah, listen. I mean, seventy six. Any both good. You know, Howard we, Davis, we, Howard Scully, Davis, yeah, Sugar Ray Leonard, the Spinks brothers. You know, the, 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 the Leo Randolph. There was some iron on that. And then team. the eighty four. Correct. You know, Sweet, Sweet pea. pea. You know, Holyfield, yeah, Breland. 100%. Uh, Taylor, Meldrick Taylor. Yeah, there was of, some uh, great matches. Yeah. But, but I, lo very, I love that debate, right? I'll, I'll tell you what. It, a, a, a dream debate would be me, you, Buddy McGirt, John Scully, and we put the teams oh together. We put it together, and we matched them up. <laughs> the Ice and I Man. think I think the seventy. We've kind of felt, oh, maybe the seventy sixteen <laughs> might come out ahead by one fight. Right, you know, right, 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 some right. fights could go either way. You yeah. know, so listen. Uh, but for me in 76, 84 didn't exist yet, did it? Sure. So, uh, yeah. you know, as a 15-year-old kid watching the stories being told to us by Howard Cosell, you know, what, no, learning about Howard Davis, who really was my inspiration of that team. Because Rest in peace. His, yeah, and, and his mom had died 
two weeks before the games, and he still went. And Leonard fighting with, you know, the tape picture of his girlfriend on, on the sock. You know, he had, his tape, right. had her picture taped to his sock. And the way Cosell presented it, you know, like I think the world somehow misses and doesn't understand what the way boxing was presented in those days. And it made you feel like these guys were household names, Dave. You know, they, they became household names. And um, that's what that that's was the first thing that got me all excited. And that summer, I hung a heavy bag in, in our garage, and uh, I built a speed bike platform using the steel from uh, old wooden lo- uh, old lawn chairs. You know, I put, put wood and I screwed it all together, and I built a speed bike platform, built my own little gym, and and then when um, when the movie when Rocky came out in in November of that year, that kind of sealed the fate and. Uh, that's what I wanted to do for, for the rest of my life. And, and as a little kid growing up outside of Montreal, you know, in a, in a little town of 5,000 people, you know, to be able to have dreamed this at that time and then make it a reality in my life, like I still sometimes am amazed that that happened, you know, that, uh, that, I, that, that, that I thought about wanting to be in boxing in some way. And I used to watch the fights and the, the fighters and the trainers. I used to tell people, you know, other fighter, uh, fighters watched, and they, they had different people that they were heroes. My heroes had a, a towel over their shoulder and a cotton swab in their mouth. You know, those were the guys I watched, you know, and I watched the coroner, and I watched how they worked. And I'm living what I thought and dreamt about as a 15-year-old kid. So, um, yeah, it's not so cool. So, 76, they have the Olympics. You get bit. Mm-hmm. Rocky comes out. Now you're, it's, it's deep in your blood. Correct. Yeah, you're, you're sick for life. Yeah, yeah. Um, three years later, you're working with Vinnie Curdo. Yeah. Tell me about that. How did that, how did that hookup happen? That's, that's still to me, you know, uh, a great moment in my life uh, because lots happened with, with Vinny. Um, Vinny was in Montreal. He was world rank, world rank middleweight. He's in Montreal and I'm training as an amateur fighter at the, at the famed Olympic boxing club. The Olympic boxing club back in those days in Montreal was what was the equivalent to what the cronk was in the States, you know, or the fifth street gym like that, that more the fifth street gym, I'd say that was the, that was the place. All the pros trained there. Sp- speaking of, I'm sorry, because you were talking about trainers, the guys that you love were the guys with yeah. the health, and you just talked about the Fifth Street Dream, and it just made me think about Angelo, Angelo Dundee. Yeah. And I know I know that you're the guys that you really idolize. I mean, I don't know about idolize, but that you really look up to in that world. I mean, we're talking Futch. We're talking um, uh, 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 Dundee. Dundee. Um, you know, Arcel. Yeah, Ray you Arcel, know, Freddie Brown. You know, guys like that. I, I, I think that as a result of Vinny, while I was training in the gym and I met him and I said, I seen this guy's picture in boxing magazines. And so I, after a couple of days, I drummed up the courage to say, are you Vinny Curdo? And he says, yeah. I said, oh, I seen your, your picture in boxing magazines. I read about you. You know, I know you fought Rodrigo Valdez and he was really impressed that a young kid like me knew about it. And I said, do, do you do road work? And he said, yeah. I said, do you mind if I go running with you in the morning? And you're 18 at this time. I'm 18. And uh, he said, yeah, sure. So the daily running became running, then breakfast. And then it became running breakfast and then hanging out all day. And then it became running breakfast, hanging out all day, and then going to the gym with him uh, at night. And now all of a sudden I'm seeing my, myself transform from training as a boxer to being a boxing trainer. And I'm working with him, and I'm pointing out things, and we're talking boxing, and we're discussing stuff, and we're talking. He's, ta- he's telling me about Angelo, who was his first trainer, and who he introduced me to later. And Angelo became a friend of mine later in life, you know. And uh, I'll tell you the story about Angelo later. But, um, you know, it was, uh, it was special that he introduced me to that. And when a guy like Vinnie Curdle gives you the, the belief that there's something there, you know, and he would brag about me in f- openly in front of people. This guy knows more about boxing than any of you in here. You know, he knows what, and I'm, oh, wow, I'm feeling good. At 18, once a guy like Vinnie Curdle tells you that, it's it's something special. So uh, that's how I started working with him. My, my first pro corner I ever worked was October 2nd, 1979. Uh, Vinnie against Marciano Bernardi from, from New Jersey. Vinny won an eight-round decision. The next fight was the main event at the Montreal Forum, November 6, 1979. Vinny beat Eddie Mello on a 10-round decision. And when they announced the decision and Vinny won, his handlers picked him up and carried him, and he reached down and grabbed me and hugged me and w- wouldn't let me go, you know, while he was on their shoulders, you know. So that was, was kind of special. How did it feel? Yeah, it was... Uh, it's, it's the bug you always keep trying to get again and again. It's what you chase, you know. It's the, that's chasing the dragon, you know. That's... Uh, that's uh, was special, and that it was done when I was so young. Uh, 
And that's why, you know, the, out of all the trainers that are around and have evolved today, Buddy might be a close second, but outside of Buddy, I don't know many guys, and I'm lucky because I started so young that I'm almost that last link between the Angelo Dundees and Eddie Futches and Gil Clancy's of the world because I started so young, I was on the tail end of their great careers, you know? So I got to meet all of them, talk to all of them, learn from them. John Davenport was another guy who was so instrumental in my, in my upbringing. And I got to meet these guys because I started so young. And a lot of the other trainers that are around now, you know, might be my age, but didn't start as young as I did. So they didn't get that connection with the past. So I see the difference between what trainers were like now, or then, and what they are like now. And I, I try to keep that, some of those old traditions alive, uh, including wearing a tie when I work the corner. So that's the it's respect It's funny, I was going to ask you about your, about your your attire, because uh, a tie or a tie, you, <laughs> you're always wearing a shirt and tie, which which I appreciate, but I'm wondering, is that it's part of the old school, part of the work ethic? Yeah, like, you the know, professionalism. I, saw pictures, I saw pictures of Bundini Brown back in the day and some of those trainers wearing, wearing a tie in the, in the corner, and I thought it was respectful to the craft you know it was it was and i thought that the boxers deserved that that i I should show a little respect to the sport to the dangers it possesses to the courage that it takes for the guys to do it and so when i show up i show up like we're a real organization and uh we're proud to be here and i respect what i'm doing i mean i don't know if people know who you've worked with in the past but i mean we could just go through a, a massive list of people from jean pascal and Elider Alvarez, Alexander Usyk, uh, Loma. Lomachenko, yeah. um, so many guys. Sergio Martinez, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know Mick Conlon. Um, let's talk about. Let's just talk about Mick Conlon just for a second in this fight this weekend. Um, your role is cut man, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, Adam, he's training with Adam Booth. Yep. Yeah. Um, what are you taking from this weekend here in Nottingham? What are you taking from this fight? He's obviously fighting Lee Wood for the regular uh, version of the WBA featherweight uh, strap. Thoughts? Um, look, I, I, uh, I like what I've seen this weekend because uh, I've been with Mick since very early in his career. And the, the, the meeting happened a little bit by accident, Dave, if, 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 truth be told. Um, when, when Conlon came out of the Olympics... And with all the controversy, as you know, you know, getting robbed of the decision against the Keaton, you know, giving the finger to the Aiba officials, that whole bit. I made a pair of boxing gloves and sent them to Mick. And he thanked me on Twitter and he appreciated it and the whole bit. And that was really nice. Fast forward ahead a couple of years. He's in Vegas fighting and he's there with Adam Booth and Jamie, his brother, and uh, they're looking for a cut man. So they asked me if I could do that. And I did. And it was a great fight. He won. He stopped the guy in the seventh round. Everything went well. And after the fight, right away, Jamie came and paid me. And he, he put the money in my hand. We shook hands. And I, and I left the dressing room to go back to my other dressing room where all my stuff was because I was working with another fighter on that night. And when I got to the dressing room, I, I, I looked at the cash that he had given me. And I said, well, this is too much. You know, he's, he's given me too much. It was a relatively easy fight. I didn't have much to do. You know, it was great to, to meet them. So I went back to the dressing room and I gave him back some of the money. You know, and I said, thanks, but it's okay. You gave me too much. That's really nice of you. And I don't know if it's because of that, but the connection with, with, with Adam and with, especially with Jamie really stuck. And I think Mick liked what, what I did in the corner. And I've been with him ever since. The only fight I missed was a fight that happened here in 2020 during the pandemic when they weren't allowing any outsiders to come in. That's the only fight I've missed since then. So uh, it's special for me to be part of that. And I've seen the ups and downs of Mick and struggling with different weights, trying to make 122 and how his energy is and whatnot. And today when I saw him at the weigh-in and he was pumped and ready to go, I haven't seen that energy from him in, in, in a while. And um, I like where he is. He's in a good space. And I look, listen, I know, I know that Wood's, Wood is going to be a tough fight. You know, uh, he's, a, he's a good fighter. He gained a lot of confidence in the Shu Khan fight. Um, but... Michael is cut from a different cloth, and he has an extensive amateur background. He has success at different levels. He's been in with the best in the world, and God, he believes. So he believes in himself, and uh, and I believe in what he can do. And I think tomorrow night he shocks the world. I cannot wait for this fight. I've been. It was one of the fights. I was like, I have to come back. I mean, <laughs> like I'm not going to miss this fight. You know, right, right. when this fight was announced, I was so excited for it. Um, I really love it, you know, uh, and I think the Irish contingency coming over here tomorrow, it's going to be electric, man. I mean, just even the way in earlier today. I know, it's its crazy, the the passion. We, you know, we, we don't get to see a lot of that on the North American side. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little not, different. It is a little different. Now, um, 
Montreal, we get that those are the kind of fights we get. Like they're they're arena fights for fight fans, you know, they're 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 not for the corporate, they're for the fight fans. And so I, I grew up in that kind of mentality of home guy selling tickets, you know, the other guy coming in from out of town bringing his team with him. I you know, I've seen that. So it's very similar, but uh this this happens consistently and has happened consistently in the UK and it's a uh, it's they're cut from a different cloth in the way they present the boxing here and it's part of the the sporting culture it really is part of the sporting culture all across the country and uh it's something that's that's missing in north america because it north american promoters seem to have stopped doing that they got site fees from casinos and they got tev- re- uh, tv revenue from television they forgot about promoting fights they forgot about selling tickets they forgot about making it part of the community and local sales you know and uh, and that's you get a different vibe at fights in north america than you do when you when you come over here to the uk no i agree i mean i i think that uh just the, the fans over here are rabid and they really support their charges their local charges they come out and they're also knowledgeable which I like. They, oh, 100%. they, they, they do their research um, on the fighters and the, and the stories because at the end of the day, you know, it's really character development. You know, if you, if there's just two guys, you don't know fighting. Okay. It's interesting. But I mean, for you and I, <laughs> I'll watch any fight. So I like it, but, right. but to know people's backgrounds and the trajectory of their lives. And you talk about, you know, Lee Wood, what he's been through. You look at Mick Conlon, what he's been through. These guys are carrying a lot on their shoulders. There's a lot more than, than this, than, than the strap. Okay, there's a lot more mm-hmm. than the strap. The trajectories of the rest of these gentlemen's lives lay in the balance of what happens tomorrow night at the Motor Point Arena. It's it's going to be it's a very serious thing. Yeah, it is absolutely. And 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 you know, Mick's been dreaming of this since that bad decision at the Olympics. He wants a, wanted a world title and uh, got the shot now. You know, so and uh, and you know, when you're ever, whenever you're in the spotlight, you know this. You get a lot of people that love you, and you also get your haters. And I know Mick's heard both. So he wants to put that to sleep. You know, he wants to he wants to win that world title. Of course he does. Of course you know, he does. And and you know, talking about the Olympics, I mean, you've covered what six of them. Is yeah, that, that, if, yeah, six. Yeah, that's right. That's six, another six, thing yeah. that you do that I don't know if people know. You're a great commentator. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Thanks. That's I've been doing that since 1988. Uh, my last one was uh, was London. That was the last one I covered. Uh, Canadian box uh, broadcasters started using the generic feed for any for Olympics after that because we didn't have any performance on the Canadian squad. But I go back to when Canada was ranked tenth in the world and we had Lennox Lewis and Egerton Marcus and Raymond Downey winning medals and you know we were on the podium uh, back in those days. So uh, I was fortunate enough to do that and uh, I did six Olympic games. It was nice. Speaking of Canadian boxing, um, I know you work a lot with Mark Ramsey. Yeah. Um, Man, what's up with him and light heavyweights? It's, it always seems know, to be light crazy. heavyweights. I, I what, what's up with him and 175 pounders? I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know why is that. And he gets. He, the, he, he gets seems to ones. really like that yeah. that, that, that that division that weight class. Yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, but really, seems to have brought a lot of shine. Former hockey player, right, Mark? Yeah, Mark played hockey. We all did. Well, you know, yeah, Can- yeah, Canada, yeah, obviously playing hockey. Uh, but he was pretty serious so, about it. I think. Right. I think didn't he go to to the boxing gym just to kind of stay in shape, maybe in the off season, and he got bit by the bug. Uh, I know he went in and, and started boxing as an amateur, so I don't know what his career was developing like as an amateur. Yeah. He was also into heavy metal music. He right. was really into that kind of stuff. Okay. And, uh, and then boxing got him. And uh, yeah. we teamed up uh, just before the Olympics in Greece. He started tr- using my gym to train his fighters at, and when he made the decision to turn pro, he asked me if I would be the, the cut man for, for his team. And that was kind of when I made the decision that I was kind of getting out of my, you know, coaching career and going to the gym every day like I used to to just having to go to camps and work with fighters specifically for fights and that was that was more fun I enjoyed that time especially with with Mark and uh, and Jean Pascal getting ready for for fights and going away to training camp Roy Jones would be with us and I enjoyed camp I enjoyed doing those kind of things and I did that with Wilder for five years as well is it true that you've decided to kind of step away a little bit from the trainer uh, circle because of family you want to spend more time with family and yeah it's just too time consuming you know it's just too time consuming to do it you know run the business and also it's it's unfair to the fighters if i would be doing that it would be unfair to them because of the number of fighters i'm working with now sure as a cut man and being on the road so much so it wouldn't be really fair for me to do that so i prefer that any of the fighters that i work with if they want me to go into camp I'm happy to go into camp with them, spend a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever it is, uh, anywhere that's got a pool hall, I'm happy to go to and, uh, 
can go to camp and just work with one specific fighter at a time for a specific match. I like doing that. It's uh, it's where my time has come. You know, like uh, listen, I did the I, I was I coached for over thirty years. You know, every day in the gym at five thirty for thirty years. So, and I did what. I set out to do from when I was a kid and what I believe that was instilled in my mind from Vinny and from working with John Davenport and watching Emmanuel Stewart when he was just an amateur, when he was training amateurs, was to take fighters and develop them from the amateur stage right to a world title. And in 1997, I got to do that. Well, yeah. I was going to say, can we talk about Otis for yeah. a second, Otis Grant, and what was that like in Sheffield that night That was against uh, Rhodes? It's still the highlight of my life. Is because, that? Yeah. yeah, it's still the highlight of my life because of the... Of, is that know, because you had more hair and it was darker, or is it because partly? <laughs> but it was a, it was part of the it was part of the thing that we dreamed about. You know, yeah, like when yeah. he was a kid, sure. comes into the kid, he's, he uh, comes into the gym. He's thirteen years old. Right. He wants to learn. I said, "Oh, this kid got something special." Sure. You know? And you know, he does something. He looks a little fights a little like Hagler, and oh, this is good. And I'm thinking, oh, we're gonna win a world title. And I'm dreaming. I'm a little kid, right? I'm still a kid, and I want to do this. And uh, you know, that was 1981 when I started training him, and 1994, 93, 94, he wins the a world title. And, and the uh, Steel that City was special, and, you know, and that's something that I developed from the ground up, you know. Absolutely. And, and to prove it wasn't a fluke, I did it again with Lemieux, you know, right, uh, right, from sure. the ground up. Uh, David Lemieux. And there's not a lot of guys that can make that claim. You know, there's a lot of trainers who work with, with fighters that are already made or come out of an ex- extensive amateur background or whatnot but correct you know mark did it with jean pascal and antonin de carry and you know i did it with with uh otis and lemieux and howard grant and so hercules Cavello, some fighters that you know went on to be world ranked after i had started them from when they were kids but now i got to a point in my life where there's not enough years now to be developed to have time to develop these guys so i preferred the transitional role of going in as a as a cut man and the and the guys who use me understand that I bring more to the corner than just a cut man you know that I am still a coach at heart I'm still a trainer at heart I see things in the corner that others don't see and I can share that with the coach and I can when I scream an instruction it comes from a good place there's so much that I, I want to ask about that I mean going back to that night first of all the, the Otis night I mean what a night I think Dom Engel was in the corner of the other uh, so of was Rhodes. his father yeah, Brendan. His father. Um, yeah. Artie Palula, was he? Yeah, Art Palula was the promoter. He was Art the promoter. promoter. Yeah, him Mike and Goodall was the ring announcer. Oh, was he? Okay. And I, I love that. that man. Yeah. I, I, I think he was a great compare. Um, and he's like the hardest working man in boxing. Yeah, wow. He's just wonderful, man. Um, I remember that night well. Yeah. And, but both guys were southpaws. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rhodes would switch. He would back switch, and right. Forth. But, yeah. But he but could do uh, south. He could fight southpaw. Yeah. Yeah, what a night. It was it was great for me. One thing I took from that night was that at the press conference before the fight, uh, I had told people about my love for Sheffield and how I dreamed of coming to Sheffield. But my dream to come to Sheffield was to watch the World Snooker Championships because that's where the World Snooker Championships are held every year. It wasn't for a fight. So it's ironic how Sheffield became synonymous for my, my love of snooker and, uh, and having won a, my first world title uh, in that city. So uh, Sheffield holds a special place in my heart for me. And having one there in a place for, that's famous for snooker I, was nice. Great city, great experiences. <clears throat> um, I have a question because I know that you like you keep alluding to snooker. I know you, you like billiards yeah. very, very much. But I also know you're into magic. Um, that's a, a pastime of yours, a hobby. Yeah. Now, was Otis's name, because his nickname was Magic, was that because of you? Did you? Good, good question. No. Uh, Has anyone ever asked was, you that? No, they haven't asked that. But uh, I, I'm, it's, I was curious. I've always wanted to ask that his I, name, I, his nickname was yeah, Magic. Yeah, I always wanted to ask you that. Um, believe it or not, it came from uh, I nick I named him that when we were with the other kids in the in 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 the neighborhood playing basketball. Okay, so like it was Magic, Magic, Magic Johnson. Johnson it yeah. was a na- it just kind of gave him the name of off of magic johnson and he played just like magic and it was powerful and uh, it's funny but it's kind of magical that he's your first world champ and what's ironic about the magic dave is um that when i started getting into boxing when i was 15 i was working at a sporting goods store i was a ski technician i used to install bindings on skis and stuff like that fix bikes in the wind in the summer and had a guy working with us who was a friend of mine that we had played little league ball together and he was working uh, there he used to string tennis rackets and um, he got into magic, 
and he started performing and he would do tricks and he would show us tricks that he'd do. And I was, oh, wow, that's really cool. And, you yeah, know, yeah. and I'm drinking, I'm talking about boxing. My workshop is filled with posters of boxers. Right, you know, right, right. About and he's doing magic. So I learned some magic from him. We talked boxing, et cetera. Well, you know, I went on to have, thank God, quite a successful career in boxing. And he at one point was, I guess what you could say, the number fourth ranked magician in the world and is still active today, and all the mag magicians know him. His name is Alain Chaquette. They all know him. Copperfield has gotten tricks from my friend Alain, and the irony of that is that we were two kids from a really small town, 5,000 people. We had a dream of wanting to do something, and we became among the best in our field in the, in, from a dream that we had as, as kids, and uh, that's kind of crazy. Like when you look back on it, now that I'm 16, I look back on it. I was a 15 year old punk kid. You know, I wanted to be in boxing. This guy was doing card tricks. You know, I wanted to be a magician and we became, you know, we went to the apex of our, of our, of our sports and our, our trades, which is kind of cool. When you were boxing, I mean, you campaigned at 118. Am I right? Yeah. I didn't and, know all this stuff. And then you, know. and then you, you had one fight at 126, which wasn't your weight. And it turned out bad for you. Yeah, that was my loss, and that and, was. And did you was that were did right then? Were you like, okay, that's not going to happen? Yeah, and I had started smoking by then as well. You know, that's okay. why it was not good. You know, there it takes a certain something to be a fighter. Sure, but I knew, I knew though in my heart, I don't know how, but I knew no matter what the sport was going to be, I was going to be a coach. I was going to be a coach in something, whether it was going to be baseball, hockey, boxing. I was going to be a coach in something, and to this day, I know that I can coach. Anything I learn about a little bit, I can coach it. I have that whatever ability is to break something down and teach somebody to do something and show them the pros and cons and the strengths and weaknesses and be able to get it done and teach them the proper technique and the form to do it. And my greatest accomplishment as a trainer hasn't been the great fighters that I worked with. It's been the mediocre fighters that have gone beyond where they should have gone because of their talent. And the, my greatest claim on that is a, is a kid named Ron Donaldson who came to my gym when he was 11 years old. He was so bad, we nicknamed him the duck. That's how good his footwork was. You know, he waddled like a duck. He slapped punches. He couldn't do anything. And he became 1994 Commonwealth Games gold medalist, went to the Olympic Games. And uh, that him achieving that was greater than... Otis winning a world title because Otis was really good. You know, he had to win a world title. He was good. Ron was not. Ron shouldn't have been that good, and he was. And that proved to me that I could be a coach and uh, made me the belief that I could turn somebody into a fighter. I think it's, you know, I've known you for a number of years, and um, I think it's a testament more to, to be a great teacher. There are guys that have been fighters that doesn't mean they can be a coach. They no, might have all the knowledge 100%. in the world, but they have to be able to communicate it. Correct. And that's what's difficult. And that's one of the things that you're so good at. You're a people person. And I think, obviously, you're great at hand wrapping. You're a great cut man. And by the way, a good cut man is worth his weight in gold, in my opinion. But we can talk about that in a second. But the fact that you work with these top guys and then you continue to work with them shows that you work very well with others. You know, you're a great guy to be around. Well, thanks, Dave. Uh, you know, I, you, I appreciate that. You have a big passion for the sport, and you have a passion for people, and you care, and it shows. And I think that's why people like to be around you. And I'm bloody OCD. Like, that's why, you know, like, the, the hand wrap is, I, I got it so because I wanted to find a way to make it perfect, you know, and I devised a way to make what I felt is the perfect hand wrap, and I take care when I do it. And it's easy to, to do a wrap, you know, you can wrap, but to do it really good and to really put that fine detail on it, that's the same thing I do when I'm training a fighter. So uh, I'm lucky in that way that I, that I have that ability to do that. And I think that had I, f I fell into boxing because of Vinny Curdle. Vinny gave me the belief that I could be a trainer. John Davenport nurtured that and, and, and allowed, became my mentor and treated me with the respect that I was a trainer, not could become that I was. And, uh, but had I fallen into another sport, like I said, had it been baseball or hockey, I believe I'd have had the same type of success because I understand how a game works. I understand the analytics of it. I understand why things happen the way they do. I see things that the layman doesn't see. And that's the same with magic. You know, you do things and you can make things happen that a layman doesn't see. Slight of see. hand. Yeah, yeah. You know, also hand wrapping, right? These are the tools of the trade. Of course. And... There are so many bones, so many tiny, intricate, delicate bones 36, in there. 36, I think, is the and accurate count. The, this is what guys work with. Yeah. And you're pounding on them. People don't realize that, you know, 
the guys are wearing gloves and they're taped their gloves not to, to make it soft on the face. It's to protect your hand. Yeah, of course it is. You know, and that's why when I hear people say like, oh, bare knuckle boxing is so brutal. Yeah, sure, it's brutal. But I think real boxing is the most brutal yeah. because these have become weapons. Yeah. You know, it's like when it's taped up correctly, you know, because you, you want to protect the hand, but there needs to be circulation. can't be too tight. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to it. How did you come up with your... A lot of trial and error, you know, figuring I could make it better. Okay, this wasn't good enough. No, I'm not happy with this. And just just trial and error going back and forth of how to do things. And to this day, I still use a technique where a lot of fighters, a lot of trainers today, when they, they wrap hands, they use a pad. They make a, a pre-made pad where they take gauze and roll it up and then they place it on the hand and then they fold it over and they make a pad. And I learned from Roger Larravee, one of the first guys to you know ever show me how to do this, and he used a method where he built the the pad right off of the roll, and I still do that. And one day I'm I'm in Cincinnati and I'm taping up a, a fighter's hands and I'm doing that, and this old man he's got his, a cane and he's walking by and he he stops, old black guy stops, he says, "Man, you old school," he says, and then walked out of the room and I saw <laughs> he recognized that. So from that era he remembered how that was done and that's how I learned and I'm the only guy I've ever seen myself uh, do that you know in of the new generation of, uh, of of guys in the game so it's just trial and error and I figured I got it right and got the feel and pull the tape just right and do it and for each guy you also have to ask them if there's have they have any issues that have to be protected you know but uh yeah i've been uh, been lucky to do that and the reputation that's another thing that it's not something that i brag about or that i post or that i try to sell you know in social media that i do this hire me you know i don't do that it's my it's all word of mouth yeah it's become a word of mouth which is the way rival boxing became you know was by word of mouth you put out a good product and eventually people will say it's good and if it's bad they're going to say it's bad let's talk about rival just for a second i love the slogan that you guys have, you know, we're boxing people trying to get into the business world. We're not business people trying to get into the boxing world. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that because you do come from a boxing background Correct. and a knowledgeable boxing background. Rival would be more successful if I was a businessman. You know, <laughs> it would be right. more successful. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. the logo? I've always wondered that. What's that? What's the logo? Well, if if I could show you, but basically, if you if you turned it upside down, you I mean, maybe you is it just the outline, the here. tribal of the gloves? No, it's uh, this is the tip of the maple leaf, right? That's the maple ah, okay. leaf upside down. Okay, right? okay. That's the maple leaf upside down, and the R on each side when you put them together. One R is for Russ, and the other one is for Rival. So that's how it kind of came. It's Canadian, and uh, that's kind of how we did it. So. I've always wanted to know what that was. Yeah, it was just yeah. a little Because I've seen rival gloves. A lot of guys wear them. In yeah. fact, okay, so hold on. <laughs> There's a funny thing that happened with us. <laughs> okay. But it was also a great night for you and your company. I know what you're talking about, yeah. Gassiev and Usyk. First time you pushed me and I, wanted to pick a fight. And, I, okay, <laughs> I, I, we're I did. It's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's true. I, I was going to say, you got to tell that story. I, I felt <laughs> terrible, man. I, you know, yeah. we were in Russia. We were in Moscow. Yep. And um, undisputed cruiserweight championship of the world um the ali trophy it was the ali trophy it was uh alexander usik and Murat gassiev what a what a night that was i mean what a what an event the fight actually turned out to be not so great it kind of fizzled you know alexander was just dominant he was dominant. but i mean that was great like to be that to be that dominant when you weren't everyone lots of people picking gassiev to win yeah gassiev yeah. was punching holes through walls yeah I mean, very strong fighter he had yeah. a great fight with doherty coast which is yes, amazing right. down in sochi man that was a that was a great fight yeah super exciting there was that was a great tournament that was a great year it was but they both used rival gloves yes they did so that must have been really exciting for you yeah well the thing that's for me the thing that I'm happiest about, Dave, with all the guys who wear Rival is they wear it because they want to. Yep, we, sure. We're not paying anybody. We don't do. We don't. I don't have the budget to make endorsement deals with guys. I have no contracts with any of the fighters. They wear it because they want to wear it. And uh, them wearing it, the, the Gassiev and um, and Usyk wearing it was the highlight for for my company. And the second one was uh, Usyk against Anthony Joshua where they both wore rivals as well, you know? So, uh, again, like I said, you know, Usyk, well, maybe not Usyk, but Joshua could, you know, could probably buy my company with, with his pocket change, you know? Like, he could, he could take it. He could choose any glove he wants. And the fact that he asks us to make them and has been using them since he won the title uh, against Charles Martin, 
I think that that's the thing I'm happiest about the most. And the same with me as a cup man, the guys I work with, you know, there's lots of guys they could choose from, you know, the fact that they find a guy in Montreal that it's because they, they like me and they want me there. So I don't try to push myself onto people. I don't try to say, Hey, please, can I be your cup man today? You know, I don't do that. If they want me, uh, you know, all they have to do is ask. And, uh, I like to, I I'm I'm glad that I'm in a position in my life now where I can be selective as to who I work with because I wanna I want my beliefs and my character to be res, uh, to be reflected in the fighter that I work with you know and uh, I like the way Conlon conducts himself I like the way Usyk and Loma conduct themselves you know their class and that's the that's the image that I love for boxing and that's what I want to see and that's what I want to be associated with. Speaking of Usyk and Loma, have you spoken to them recently? I have. I spoke. I didn't speak to Loma. I spoke to his father, and I spoke to Usyk. Uh, you know, almost every couple of days, I send a message, and uh, you know, it, it's obviously just you know questions of you know, be careful, and are you okay? And yes, we're okay now. You know, and uh, but it's obviously not okay in the sense they're okay that they're not dead. Uh, and they're not injured, no, it's, it's but it's not, not okay, okay yeah. to, uh, not how they are. So there's nothing okay about this. There's nothing okay about. You know, one day you go to bed with a color TV, a car, your apartment, all your clothes, everything you have. You, the next day you have none of that. You're you're packing a, a suitcase and fleeing a city, and your building's being bombed. One of the guys that I I taught as to be a cut man, name is Sergey. Uh, the building behind his home was detonated by mm. a bomb. You know, and uh, they had to leave. So. Uh, you know, you just leave everything there, and you—you you, it's not like you can go to the to the bank machine and take out a withdrawal. You know, and there's cash there. You know, like you have no access to that. So you go from living a regular, normal life like we're living now, and tomorrow you have nothing, and that shouldn't be happening in the year 2022. You know, that tanks can roll in and rockets can be fired upon your city. That it, it that shouldn't be happening. You know, it's it's not right. It really makes uh, the sport of boxing seem small and insignificant, of course, compared to to what they're going through. Of course, tough stuff. And it's 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 not right. Like and and as it, the the humanity of it is just despicable. Like are, are we really still going through these kind of things uh, in in this day and age in modern Europe? You know, it's not a third world nation. It's not a place that's underdeveloped. We're talking about you know. 20, 21st century Europe and tanks are rolling into your city and invading another country. And it's sickening, really, when you think about it. I mean, we sit here all nice and comfortable and talking boxing and reflecting, but these people are fighting for their lives. And uh, yeah. it's uh, it's just awful, man. I, I can't believe that it's it's even happening. And it's like the whole world's not doing anything about it. Like, how do, how are you okay with sitting around and letting this happen? And it just goes to show that, you know, the allies sometimes you think you have maybe are not your allies anymore. And uh, I don't see how this thing finishes well, you know, how the Russian people themselves are not going to suffer in the future also, you know, because they're now going to be, they're the most hated place on earth right now. We were on the verge of opening rival Russia. I was within a couple of weeks of announcing it. We've had trademarks done, the whole bit. We were going into You Russia. guys have, um, well, obviously you started in Montreal. Yeah. But you have Las Vegas. Yeah. You have UK. Yeah. And you have Australia, right? Yeah. And we were going to have, and France. And France is going to be opening soon. And uh, we were going into Russia. I had made a friend over there that I had met five, six years ago. We became friends. We've stayed in touch. He's come out to all the fights. Every time I go to Russia, he takes care of me. We developed a real bond together. And he wanted to do that. And I finally found somebody I could trust to do that, who wanted to do that and loved boxing. And we were on the verge literally of doing it. And now I'm probably too old now to ever see the realization of this. You know, we would have been the first brand to have opened in Russia, you know, a boxing brand to open an office in Russia we would have been the first one to do it. I mean, there's been other brands that had distributors, you know, like other guys selling all kinds of stuff, but this would have been exclusively rival. And we were ready to announce that we're proud to go do that. And um, now I can't do that. And now my friend is suffering as a result of that. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's not right. It's not right. Speaking of uh, going Didn't back mean to be somber about that. No, it, it's a, it's a terrible situation going on right now. And I think we need to talk about, it, especially that you work so close uh, with these fighters and, and I'm also close to those fighters yeah. and we all care about them. Of course. Um, so it's, it's, you know, we're hoping for the best. Um, but going back to friends that you talked about before, uh, you were talking about Buddy McGirt a little bit before. I, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, one of the great trainers, one of yeah. the great guys in boxing. 100%. Um, hell of a fighter and a hell of a trainer. Yeah. He honestly is a hell of a trainer. Um, but 
I'm wondering, you know, because you have worn so many hats in this boxing business, like we've talked about, and your role now, whether it's a hand wrapper or whether it's a cut man, it's not trainer, but yet you do know a lot and you were a trainer for a long time. So what is it like to be in a corner and you're seeing something, but you don't want to overstep your I overstep. Yeah, you overstep. I, I overstep. It. If I see something, I overstep. That's it. Because I remember uh, yeah. hearing some story where you 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 told Buddy something, and he and he went straight told yeah. his fighter. You were you were actually you were actually the ring announcer that night. It was in New York. Uh, Isaac Chalemba. Oh wow. Was fighting. Okay. Uh, it was on. A, I think it was on a Debella show. Okay. And uh, you were the ring announcer, and we're sitting down there, and this was one of the first times I'm I'm working with Buddy. And uh, I told him something, he went upstairs, and then I realized, okay, he's listening to what I'm saying. Right. And the way I got it, what, Buddy also did something else for me, which was really great, because it opened up a door for me, was here in Manchester. Um, I was here with Chalemba and, uh, and Buddy, and Joe Gallagher asked uh, Buddy if he would come and wrap Anthony Crawler's hands. Okay. And Buddy said, Joe, he says, you know, I do a good rap, he said, but... I'm not even doing Chalemba. He says this guy's doing it. Yeah, he's not. Yeah, he said, "Would he do? Would he He'd do? Uh, would he do?" He'd and I did. And a crawler was the first UK fighter's hand that I that I ever wrapped. Million dollar. And crawler. I always, yeah. And I always, I always, I always tell crawler he's the first guy. And uh, as a result of that, you know, I got to work with 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 Callum Smith and Liam and and all of Joe Gallagher's guys because of of that. And Callum became the second. Ali Trophy winner that I was in the corner. So I was in the corner for the first Ali Trophy win and for the second Ali Trophy win. So yeah. uh, that was a great was night. Special. And I was there too, obviously. I announced it. And that that fight was the very first boxing match ever in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. That was a great, wasn't that a great experience? It was a great I, experience. I, I loved it. And it was great. And, and, and for Callum, you know, you talk about those moments when, like, you know, Otis Grant when he won his title and these great moments that you had. When he, when Callum Smith, you know, coming from that family, of the four fighting Smith brothers, you know, proud city, Liverpool, you know, such a fighting history when he won that title and to be able to announce it and watch him, the glee, the joy, like this, oh man, it was wonderful. Well, there, that was another example. And Crawler could, Crawler is my, my living proof of this. So if he's listening to this, he's, he's the living proof of this. This is no word of a lie. Um, he's in the corner with us, me, Joe and him. And the fight's going on and, 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 Callum is having good success, but it, it's he can't get he can't get Groves in trouble, you know. Like he's he's throwing the right hand, and Grove typically, you know, rolls with the right hand and comes back with his own right hand. And I'm watching this. I'm watching this. He comes back to the corner, and before you know, we get mouthpiece out before he goes out for the next round, just to get his attention. I slapped him with an open hand right on his chest. I slapped, pop, pop. I said, throw the fucking left hook. Throw the left hook. He went out there, threw the left hook, knocked out George Groves. That's all she wrote. And 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 Crawler says, Russ, you called it, mate. You called it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so he's my only proof of that. That was the call that I was calling for that left hook. And uh, Paul Smith it. was sat behind as well, and he heard that. So when you said overstep my mark, sometimes I can. And so you as do. A coach, you're yeah. okay with that. You're not worried about it. No. So and like, I think that the coach Saturday is, night, if you see something, you're going to tell Adam Booth. Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. Now, do you, do you ever... Say it yourself when you're in the corner, or you say it to the trainer and well, let I'll them. Well, I'll say I'll say it to the trainer. You know, like we'll be sat there. There'll be myself, sure, Charlie sure. Beats, Huzefa will be there. Right. Or, or, say, look, we got to do this. Or sometimes Adam might see the same thing. So now we're both yelling right. the same instruction, and it's or like be aggressive or not or move or whatever. If we're both seeing the same thing, okay, great, no problem. I don't sure. have to make. I'll just say what he's saying. But in the event that I see something. That they're not calling, and I know that that's working. I'll, I'll yell it out, you know, and uh, and and send the message. And uh, you know, Jamie, I've, I've, I felt very comfortable having Jamie there as well because I talked to Jamie, and Jamie and his dad, like they'll say, yeah, Russ is calling the right thing. He's calling the right thing. So I know that I feel their their support on this makes you feel comfortable. So I know they don't bring me there just to shut up. I mean, come of on. course, of course. I mean. Smart people that will bring you in for the right reasons. Okay, fine, maybe to wrap the hands as a cut man, but they also want your expertise. Oh, of course. And other things, too. It'd be silly not to have it, you know? It'd be silly this not is to boxing. Have it. Yeah, that's There true. are a lot of egos. Yeah, this, this yeah there is. is. There this is. is boxing. Yeah. You Speaking of the Smiths just for a second, and let's just move on to Beefy for a second, because I know you like billiards. So he's one of the guys, so supposedly I, I hear Roy Jones, he can shoot a game of pool. Yeah, he can. Uh, Abel. Abel's good. Abel's good. Yeah. And Beefy's supposedly really Beefy's nice. Beefy's very good. Beefy he, might be the best of the He's of nice the on the felt. 
Yeah, yeah, he's he might be the best of the three because he plays snooker as well. Okay, so he's uh, he's he he might be the best of the three. Anyone else that you've come across that's really the the only uh, we were I don't know if you were with us I'm not, I'm not sure you were there when uh, Manny Pacquiao fought in Macau. No, I was not there. So I was there with Jesse Vargas, and we were in the I guess the basement of the hotel where they're having the weigh-ins and the press media and all, all that stuff, right, to stay away from the population. They had it downstairs, and Manny was there. And so Roy, you know him, Roy and Manny started talking, and I was there, and we started talking. And we talked for 20 minutes about pool right. because he's an avid pool player. Sure. So we talked about playing pool. We didn't even talk about boxing. We just talked about who we knew in the pool industry, right, the, right. the Filipinos, that the famous Filipino pool players, and we talked about that. And he invited me and Roy to go to his tournament in the Philippines. But... We haven't had a chance to do that yet, but that's something I'd like to do. But Manny is supposed to be the best. I haven't played him, you but he's supposed to be. Yet. But out of the people that I played, you know, uh, Beefy, Roy, and Abel uh, are good. Uh, the running joke I had with Abel was we were playing in Las Vegas, and I was on a run where I was winning, 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 and Abel was racking the balls. And uh, I said, Abel, you better be careful not to com commit a crime in this town. And he said, why not? I said, because your fingerprints are all over that rack. <laughs> so he's, so he's, he's fun. He's fun. Abel's fun to play. Oh, he's I a great guy. Abel. Yeah. Very great boxing But mind. you, you got to tell the story about how we met, like well, how what our initial meeting was, despite seeing you at various events, because obviously you're the ring announcer. You're talking about me I pushing you in the ring? Yeah, yeah. Tell them how you wanted to start a fight. I think that's... Uh, <laughs> tell them. Let's see you if tell you're, the story, your, please. Your, let's see if you're your the recollection is the same guest. as mine. So I, I, it was the fight. Well, I had their, they were in my ear. They were telling me to get yeah. to the center of the ring right you happen to be in a way in the center of the ring and, and this I, guy pushes me out the way man he pushes me out the way yo who you think you're pushing my ring announcer guy and then we became friends we after became that, friends so. afterwards i felt terrible man because at the time i was i was looking at my my producer q whatever and so i was not really too worried about you or yeah yeah you i see that and then, <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, and, then I, and then i realized oh, yeah. and then as i realized you were the guy mm. that I, Okay. <laughs> oh, man. But you know, that uh, it, it's funny how those things happen because I'll tell you a story. Um, when Lomachenko sparred Shakur Stevenson mm -hmm. prior to the Guillermo Rigondial fight. Sure. They were in the gym. By the way, prayers going out to Guillermo Rigondial. Oh, yeah, I man. That was he, terrible. Yeah. I hope he's doing okay. Yeah. yeah. I can't believe this. Crazy. Huh? Terrible story. Yeah. But I hope he I hope he makes a full recovery. Now, they're saying that there's a, that that they that could come back, right? But they don't they're know. They're saying, yet. yeah. Okay, I, I think it's a little so. early. I'm, I hope so, too. I, I followed him when I was doing Olympic Games. I covered all his fights as one an the, amateur. One of the so best Olympians ever. Absolutely. I mean, and, yeah. you know, not to take anything away from Loma, I mean, Rigondeal moved up two weight yeah, of divisions. Of course, to face of course, him. of course. So that, that just has to be said. I mean, so Shakur's, Shakur's in for sparring, and um, things get a little heated, and Shakur's hitting Loma low. And I and event, and now, again, now was time for me to step over and say, I say, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa <laughs> right. what's going on here? Hey, relax with the low blows, you know, and I get mad, right? Well, K, Coach K, K Karoma, you know, he starts, you know, swearing and, and calling me names and whatnot and then walks to the back of the room. Well, I didn't, I followed him. I said, yo, what, you got to say something to me. <laughs> Come tell me what, what you want to say, you know, and we, we start beefing it out, you know, and everything. And now me and him are really good friends. Good and when friends. I see him, hug him up and uh, everything is good. But it started in a very confrontational yeah, yeah, way, yeah. as with you. But uh, it's, it's very it, nice. It and, is very uh, nice. Yeah. I, I tell you, I'm, I'm so... I protect my fighters, David. You yes, know? you, have so, yeah. you have to. You have to. I'm very honored to ha that you're on the podcast today. And it, you're one of the faces I love seeing in, during fight week. And again, you, you work with the top in the game. And that's for a reason. Well, uh, thanks, Dave. I appreciate you know. it, and I'm I'm really honored that you you asked me to be on here. It's very nice, nice to go down memory lane with you as well. It's and, been uh, fun. Listen, for whatever you said about my career in boxing, you know, I remember when you started out because you have your trademark as well, and you're sure. a hard guy to miss. Uh, and you know, you've uh, you've really evolved into doing something for yourself as well uh, from a position where in the past nobody ever thought that that's a position that evolves to something and you made it evolve into something. So congratulations to you as well. And you did it outside of America as well, not only in America. So you're a real success story. Thank you, my friend. So before we leave, because my producer, Jamie, over here, is, he's so upset. I, Are he, we over the time, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and he's been waving at me, and I've been acting like I'm not seeing him. But he's like, I'm not seeing he's him. Like, <laughs> okay. and, and I've got great peripheral. Okay. <laughs> so I've seen every wave that he's okay. done, and I see him getting redder by the Sorry, minute. brother. <laughs> but yeah. would you answer a couple fan questions? 
Yeah, of course. Okay, well, great. Why not? So we have some fan I questions hope here. I can uh, answer them. Okay, great. All right, let's see. Reno Sanchez asks Russ, how did you get into the glove game? How much time went into crafting the rival glove as it is today? Um, I got into the glove game almost by, into the equipment business. Uh, or, or No, I shouldn't say that. The rival came up by accident. Um, I've been selling equipment since 1985. I started ringside equipment in Canada. I was the guy that was selling. Ringside had just started up in the U.S. I started selling in Canada. I, entered, I developed the brand in Canada. From there, I went to uh, starting title boxing in Canada. They were my friends who also worked at ringside before, and we started title boxing, and I started doing that. One day, I, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of wanting to do my own equipment because I realized, you know, both brands, Ringside and Title, you know, I developed in my country. So I kind of started to understand that people were buying equipment because it was from me. You know, it, they, were, they were trusting me that it was coming from me. So I said, I toyed with the idea. My brother came up with the name of Rival. And I get a visitor from, I get a visit from a, a supplier uh, in Asia who comes to see me and says, you know, we'd like to make gloves for you. And I show him the title gloves I'm selling. And okay. And he says, uh, you know, it's the container is the minimum order. And I said to him, listen, I'm really, this is what I want to do. I want to do this, that. I show him the pictures, the plans, what we want to do. I said, but I, I don't have the, the financing to do a, a container. He says, okay, when you do, let me know. Shook hands. He left. Next day, he comes back. I get a call from reception. They say, Mr. Tariq is, is downstairs. He wants to see you. So, okay, he comes back up. He says, oh, Mr. Russ, he says, I don't sleep last night. I said, why? He says, because I think Rival is going to be very good. He says, whatever you have, no minimum, whatever you need, I'll, I'll do it for you. I said, I've only got $2,000, Mr. Tariq. That's all I've got right now. I said, but this is what I'd like to make. He says, I make that for you. I said, if you do that for me, I guarantee you every order after that will be more than $2,000. And it has Even been. if it's only by a dollar, it'll be more. And it has been. And uh, that's how the company started. So, uh, and then the, the fight gloves took a while to develop. You know, you make a fight glove and you get one fighter who says they like it and the other, the other guy hates it. So Listen, now you're trying yeah. to find a happy medium between the two and, uh, and, and to get it consistent. Like it's one thing to develop the prototype for it, but then to put that into production and keep getting that same fit and feel that Correct. you loved in the prototype, that's not easy. So that, that took a while, but uh, we're in a good place now and we've got a good glove. And like I said, the people who wear them, wear them because they want to, not for any other reason. Would you say it's more like, you know, Reyes is known as a puncher's glove. See, that's a myth. You know, that... But it is the myth, right? Yeah. And, and some people wear Grant, some people wear... Yeah. There, there's so many different types of gloves, you know, Everlast and yeah. Leone, all, all kinds of wonderful gloves out there. What do you look at rival? Where do you where do you feel that you're uh, we're, as a glove? I, I'm never going to say we're better than anybody. No, because but, but what would you say the strength of the glove is? is it comfort? Well, the, the fit it? the fit I think is is you know the, the fit is when you get in like we built it in a way because I wrap hands I designed it in a way that it'll accommodate the hand wrap that I wrap. Right. So, and if you wrap your hands like I do, which is good, you know, a good wrap, you're going to get into our glove without being constricted sure. in any way. Um, I, I, the thing that about the puncher's glove, every time somebody says that to me, I say, please, you have to understand, you're the puncher, not the glove, okay? You're, if, you, if you're a puncher, don't blame the glove. Right. Because at the end of the day, putting a glove on a fighter is the equivalent of putting your bed pillow on the bumper of your car and hitting somebody at 100 yeah. miles an hour. Yeah. It's irrelevant. <laughs> you know, it's, you might not get as much blood on the bumper, but that's about it. Sure. Uh, so when you can punch... In, in any of the gloves that any of the top brands make, whether 100%. it's mine, Grant, uh, winning, if you can punch, you're knocking somebody out. Uh, it, 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 to correlate, like I was a drummer, right? I used to play drums, and I've seen these guys with the this and the double bass and the, how many tom-toms, and then, and then you see a guy with just like a hi-hat and a, or a paint bucket, and he's just, you know, just yeah. killing it. If, if you can play, you can play. If you yeah, can correct. punch, you, but can, you punch. can punch. Exactly, exactly. There's no, you're talking about an 8 and 10 ounce glove. Right. So there's not much there to begin with correct. in any brand you're looking at. There's not much there's there. There's not so, much. Uh, that's not the difference between getting knocked out. And whoever believes that, you know, now you're looking for uh, a reason that lays somewhere else instead of looking at yourself. Because I'll tell you what, Arthur better be wearing 16 ounce gloves. He's crushing guys you know 18 ounce gloves he's crushing guys uh, in the gym because he can punch doesn't matter the size of gloves he's wearing got that fight coming up with joe smith jr huh indeed man 
Yeah, another great Woo. one. Yeah. Love I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Love yeah. both guys. Yeah. I've known Joe a long time. Yeah, he's a good guy. He's who announces fights in the guy. amateurs. That's right. Oh, yeah. Great guy. Matt. Great guy. And his trainers and uh Yeah, Jerry. Good, yeah, yeah Jer- his, Jerry and his Jacob brother. Bianco, yeah, yeah the great guys. Absolutely. And uh and, and Arthur, I mean, I got to spend time with him up there in Canada. Oh, okay. When he was up to Kel Brook used to train up there. Uh Kel Brook. Yeah, Kel Brook was up there. Um Arthur Better be of, I think it was in Toronto. Oh, okay, okay. It was in Toronto. Okay. Okay. Um, I did some shows for Lee Baxter. Oh, right. Okay. And those guys were down there. Yeah. And we all got to hang out and we had a lot of fun. And then Arthur's great guy. He's hilarious. He really is. Oh, my God. He's hilarious. There was a really tough fight against Callum Johnson. I don't know if you remember that fight. Sure, I do. That was. Sure, I remember that. That I was, was there. close. I was there. That was very close. I was there. Uh, and that was unfortunately. Normally, I work with Callum Johnson as his, as his cup man and hand wrapper. But, you know, like. It, yeah, how does that go when you. Well, look, I mean, I've been with Arthur since. You know, since his pro debut, like I've been in his corner for every fight except the last one because I got COVID. But, you know, that, there are certain guys that, you know, I have to stay loyal to because I've been with them for that length of time, you sure. know, and, and I don't want someone to use me just to say, oh, we're going to use him because I won't do it. I just no, work of course corner. not. I of hate course. that stuff. So of course. I won't do that. Uh, but uh, in, in this case, I, Callum, I work just every now and then. If I happen to be in the U.K., if Joe had me, I would. But well, I was going to say because jo- Callum was at Joe's gym. That's right. He was well, at Joe Gallagher. Correct. And I worked his corner when he fought Carpensi, mm-hmm. I believe, mm-hmm. you know, in New York. Okay, I was there. He used me, no problem. But it wasn't like an everyday thing. So when the fight sure. got announced against Callum Johnson, what, what could I do? Yeah, you know, you're with I, Arthur. I gotta, I'm with Arthur. He's you my know, guy. He told Arthur, when I announced him, he told me, because uh, I'm very specific about asking about names and pronunciations, and he told me Baturbiev. So that's what I say. Yeah, Baturbiev. But most everyone says better be of. Yeah. My friend says better believe. <laughs> yeah, better, better believe. believe. Better believe. Yeah, but it be, uh, yeah, I guess the North American pronunciation, if we read it as we would, you know, phonetically, it's uh, yeah. better beev. You know, works. Sure. Better beev. That's what he told it, me. So what, I, I, it's a question of where the accent is on, right? Sure. So, so speaking it, of you, you obviously you speak English. You speak French. Very, yeah, it's very, you speak French. English, French. And and you do speak Spanish. you Spanish Spanish too. Yeah. Un poquito, yeah. Un poquito. When it comes to when it comes to boxing, I'm very comfortable to speak in in Spanish. Sure. Sure. And ordering food. I'm good with ordering food. That's <laughs> there you go. That's important. <laughs> okay. Uh, before my uh, producer has a has a heart attack over <laughs> here. Okay. S- next question. Peter underscore Davy sixteen asks Russ, do you agree with the general consensus that it's a Wood KO or Conlon points this weekend? No, I don't. I, I don't think so. I think uh, in both cases. Uh, I think I think Ben Davidson was right. He says we could win on points or we could win by knockout. Said, yep, they're very good. You're right. We could sure. uh, both of both of them could. So uh, I don't think it's a consensus that I don't think Woods can only win by knockout, right, and right. I don't think that uh, Conlon can only win by by points. You know, sure. uh, I think it's a very very more evenly matched fight than than people think. I uh, do too. That's yeah. why I just I'm yeah. made up for this fight. I think uh, people might be underestimating McConlon. Final question. David Cartwright asks Russ, can you tell us any stories when you've been hand wrapping and you've had to start again from a protest from the opposition? Never happened. Never happened. And I will... Uh, Buddy McGirt, who I trust, but, you know, we weren't always close. As I worked against him when uh, with Martinez, with Sergio Martinez. And he came into the dressing room, watched me rap for two minutes, and said, I'm out of here. Yeah, does and, not, uh, yeah got because nothing. he's he he knows that I'm not gonna cheat, you know. Sure. And uh, I won't because that's the part of boxing that I hate the most. You know, I hate what happened to Billy Collins, I hate what Oof. Panama Lewis did to Luis Resto, you know, like I I hate that shit. Assault I hate in the, the ring. Cheating. If you haven't I seen hate. if you haven't seen that movie, yeah. everyone uh, Assault in the Ring. So when I often when I'm with uh inspectors or 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 the other camp. Sometimes I feel the other camp comes in just as, oh, this is a free opportunity to watch Russ Amber wrap hand. It's like a free hand wrapping lesson. Right, that's right, that's right. the sense I get when they're watching me. Sure. I know they're not watching me because they think I'm cheating. Right. I, because I have a good reputation. They're not watching. They're getting a free hand wrap lesson is what they're getting, you know, and that, that pisses me off. You know, they get to watch that. And uh, the inspectors, I say, whether you're here or not, I'm wrapping the same way. 100%. I wrap the same way in the gym. I wrap the same way. I'm, I'm not going to cheat. I won't do that. And uh, I believe strongly in that. I mean, I know we have to watch, you know, okay. 
but uh, I don't I don't play that I don't play that and so I've never had somebody have to ask me they've tried to raise issues like we had a case where a guy says hey uh, you're using more gauze than you're allowed to you're only allowed to use two rolls I said yeah but off of the roll I already built a pad other people already have their pad ready you're watching that's because they don't understand they don't get it right so I said yeah you 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 didn't mind when the guy put a pad on your hand which took a roll for him to make that pad and then he used two more after you don't think about that I built it right off the roll you saw me do it you know the other, other other incident I had was in when when Callum fought uh, Canelo. It was with te the Texas Commission, and we had three inspectors watching me wrap. And like I said to you, I'm building the the wrap right off of the roll, right? So they're seeing it come off the roll. Sure. So I do finish it up, and then the guy grabs Callum's hand and he starts moving the stuff and pressing. <laughs> hey, hey! I said, "What are you doing?" <laughs> well, we have to check it. I said, "Bro, you had six eyes watching." What are you checking now after it's already done? You watched it go on. Right. I got really irate with that, and they were threatening to throw me out the corridor. And Did I, you have to rewrap or no? no, no it was no, okay. It was re okay. It was okay. Of course, it was okay. Sure. Like I said, I don't cheat. Uh, yeah. So no, but I mean, did did he mess it up? No, did he didn't. No, he didn't yeah, mess yeah. it up. But just the fact that he's he's doing this, and I'm right. like like he's saying he's doing his job. Bro, you watched me do it, man. Right. What are you pressing on? What exactly do you think you're going to, you think you're going to find, by pressing, you're going to find something right. that you didn't see me put in there? Like right. I put a roll of quarters or something in there. You're going to see, it. <laughs> stop, man. You know, that, that's the other thing, you know, commissions and whatnot. You know, they, they're, they're so worried about how much Vaseline you're using. Oh, you put too much Vaseline. Yo, bro, guys are beating the shit out of each other with baseball bats in there. And you're worried about Vaseline. Really? You know, so they, they want to, they just want to impose sometimes, you know, and that, that, but me and Abel talk about that all the time about how they just want to feel like they're important to tell you what you must do. I've been in this game 43 years. You weren't even born when I was wrapping hands. So please, you're not going to tell me how to do that. So. And different commissions in different places have yeah. different rules and different people that know what they do. I mean, Correct. you go to a place like, you know, we're here in the UK, obviously the British Boxing Board of Control, you're in Las Vegas, you're in New York, you know, there are places, you know, California, there's some, there's some, you know, top commissions out there. Yeah. And, and I have good, good relations with a lot of them, you know, yeah. and usually it's more the, the inspector who's trying to make his right. mark in the dressing room, you know, try to, sure. but you know, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens sometimes and it happened then. So listen, we have a great fight this weekend. Um, can't wait. I think, uh, the motor point arena here in Nottingham is going to be buzzing. Um, going to go get some good food. What's up? All right, we're going to wrap right now. Wrap. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. <laughs> anyway, we'll be back next week. We'll be back next week with uh, Warrington and Martinez, too. Should be a great fight up in Leeds. And uh, that's it. Russ, thanks Glad a lot, Glad to buddy. have you back, brother. Yeah, thank Glad you, to friend. have you back, Talk man. Talk soon. All right, buddy. All right, thank cheers. You. Thanks, guys.